Hello, America. My name is Dylan John, and you are listening to the Neo Fusionist Book Review. This is not your typical book review, as I make no claims to political or philosophical impartiality. This podcast uses the format of a book review to explore the premise of Neo Fusionism. Neo Fusionism is the merging of paleoconservatism with naturalism within the framework of the revitalization of the Republican Party. We will be exploring politics, philosophy, psychology, economics, and sociology through a wide variety of books published both recently and historically. Thank you for tuning in. For today's episode, we'll be looking at a book by the name of The Great Debate, Edmund Burke, Thomas Paine, and the Birth of Right and Left by Yuval Levin. Now, this book is going to carry on many of the themes that we've been looking at thus far. Uh, In particular, it it really picks up off much of the things that we saw in the last book, uh, A Conflict of Visions by Thomas Sowell. Uh, In that book, Mr. Sowell uses a number of historical figures to illustrate his points. Uh, One of the main figures that he draws from is Edmund Burke. Uh, He also looks at Adam Smith and Friedrich Hayek, and we'll be exploring those figures as well in future episodes. But in this episode, we're going to look more closely at Edmund Burke. And uh, this book, The Great Debate, it contrasts uh, Edmund Burke with Thomas Paine. Uh, Both are figures of the same era, and they uh, published a series of pamphlets and books, many uh, many of which were actually responding to arguments of the other. And so there was sort of this back and forth between the two. Um, Edmund Burke is considered uh, one of the founders of uh, conservatism in the modern era. Uh, so he was writing around the time of the French Revolution, shortly before, uh, and Again, Thomas Paine was writing around that same time as well. This was also around the time of the American Revolution. And Thomas Paine was uh, an an important figure in the American Revolution. And so um, I don't want to say that everything Thomas Paine had to say was was terrible. Uh, Some of his ideas were were important in, in building the ideology that became sort of the American creed. Uh, But Edmund Burke uh, really, I think, lays out the better case. And so we're going to look at this book much, we're going to spend much more time looking at Edmund Burke's arguments in this book as presented by Yuval Levin, uh, and we're not going to spend nearly as much time looking at Thomas Paine. Uh, So Thomas Paine sort of considered as the beginning of the modern left by this author, and Edmund Burke the beginning of the modern right. Uh, And so it's that same sort of contrast between these two figures and their opposing visions of of reality that can that kind of carry on the same conflict of visions that we saw previously between the constrained and the unconstrained visions, uh, as Thomas Sowell lays it out. And again, following along, if we if we go back to pragmatism and uh, the tender-minded and tough-minded uh, temperaments that uh, William James lays out in that book, um, this kind of continues this same theme. We'll be looking more at this contrast between uh, between a, a more rationalist and a more empiricist sort of perspective, the idealist versus the realist um, perspective that we've been exploring in the, in the past couple of books. We explore more in this book and we'll be exploring more in the next book as well. Um, and I think it's a, it's a pretty interesting way to look at these issues. And again, every uh, every one of these books that presents these different sort of contrasts it's not you're not you're not looking at the exact same contrast each time the, every author is going to approach this sort of slightly differently um, and so this author gets more into sort of the nitty-gritty of uh, of Edmund Burke's philosophy and and it does dovetail or, or it does fit right smoothly into the constrained vision of Thomas Sowell. And just as a quick refresher, the constrained vision is is the sense that essentially human beings operate within constraints. And those constraints are both internal and external. Now, the external constraints uh, 
uh, are largely acknowledged by people everywhere. We live on this planet, right? We don't we, we, we have to adapt our lives to the circumstances of reality. Like we have to eat. We have to kill to eat, right? That's, a, that's, that's nature's law. And, we, and we're constrained by that in our lives, right? Um, and so, so there's sort of these external constraints. And then there are also internal constraints in the sense of human beings have a specific nature to them, that there is a human nature and that we're constrained by our human nature and and in more particularly society is constrained by human nature as regards what sort of society is feasible and what sort of society is not feasible um, there are some things that we some societies that we can imagine but because we can imagine it doesn't mean we can live it whereas the unconstrained vision says well if you can imagine it you can do it. All you need is the adequate will and the adequate uh, reason and rationality to be able to figure out how to how to make it happen. Um, but there's nothing that we can't do if we set our minds to it. That's that's the core of the unconstrained vision. Constrained says no. There actually are things that we just can't do because people are people and they're going to they're going to behave like people every time. So that's the, that's the basis of that for the quick review of the last book. And then we dive into that in some more detail in this book, and in particular Edmund Burke's position uh, as regards those, those things. So like usual, I've got a, a couple of sections that I want to read here. This book, I actually have quite a few sections I want to read, but the parts that I want to read tend to be a little bit shorter. Um, and... You know, I'm, I'm going to look at Edmund Burke, and I'm not going to look at Thomas Paine an awful lot. He mentions some of the sections that I read uh, are going to mention Thomas Paine, but I'm not going to get into detail in Thomas Paine's contrasting position. Uh, suffice to say, Thomas Paine embraces the unconstrained vision. And if you want to get more detail about that, I highly recommend you pick this book up and give it a read. It's it's really good, and it really this especially this book combined with the last book, these two books together can give you a great understanding of these two competing worldviews uh, that that are with us to this day. Uh, there they were with us several centuries ago when Edmund Burke and Thomas Paine lived, and they're still very much uh, very real in today's uh, policy debates and, and, and different philosophical orientations that we see among conservatives and nationalists and progressives and liberals um, and so on. So I'm going to get right in here and start reading a little bit as we start to get into uh, ed, uh, the dispute between these two men uh, regarding the nature of of humanity. Uh, clearly, they have fundamental differences regarding how they conceive the nature of man and the nature of humanity. And so I'm going to explore Edmund Burke's vision on the nature of humanity in this section here. And, and also, um, I am going to, a lot of this book uh, quotes from the writings of Edmund Burke and Thomas Paine. So, um, uh, I'm going to give an outer quote, and then I'll give an inner quote when I'm when I'm quoting from something that the author quotes, and then an outer quote ending when uh, when when my reading is done. So, <clears throat> to begin, he says, outer quote: "The beginnings of any society," Burke writes, "are almost certain to involve some form of barbarism, not to say crime." But over time, by slowly responding to circumstantial exigencies, societies develop more mature forms, a process that, as Burke puts it in the Reflections on the Revolution in France, mellows into legality governments that were violent in their commencement. A return to beginnings would thus not offer an opportunity to start anew on proper principles but would rather risk a reversion to barbarism. There is a sacred veil to be drawn over the beginnings of all governments, Burke argues, because there is little to be learned by exposing them, and there is a very real risk of harm in the exposure itself, especially the risk of weakening the allegiance of all the people to their regime by exposing its imperfect origins. This 
rejection of the importance of beginnings separates Burke from the vast majority of political thinkers in the Western tradition, from Plato and Aristotle through Hobbes and Locke and their modern successors. These thinkers have argued that a founding is a crucial political moment, when the character of a regime is decisively given shape. As detailed in later chapters, Burke argues instead that a regime takes shape over time, and is never, in fact, the effect of a single instantaneous regulation. Thus, its original shape, let alone the origin of all political society, is not so crucial as its current shape and function in its development to this point. Paine roundly criticized Burke's denigration of beginnings, arguing that it is simply an effort to avoid confronting Britain's particular illegitimate origins. A certain something forbids him to look back to a beginning, lest some robber or some Robin Hood should rise from the long obscurity of time and say, I am the origin. Burke does acknowledge a concern of this sort, noting that an intimate familiarity with the barbarous origins of the regime may undermine the people's patriotism. But his greater concern is that in looking past history in search of nature, people would look past the best available source of wisdom and instructions to a source of little, if any, useful knowledge about political life. Burke never quite bothers to dispute the particular assertions that Paine and other liberal theorists make about what man's pre-social nature might tell us, because he thinks it is absurd to think about a pre-social man to begin with. We need to understand man as he is, and to our knowledge at least has always been, a social creature living together with others in an organized society with a government. To imagine him as solitary and asocial is to ignore man himself in pursuit of an abstraction with little to teach us. I have in my contemplation, the civil, social man, and no other, Burke writes. The institutions of society are certainly conventional, he argues. They are often the contrivances of deep human wisdom, not the rights of men, as some people, in my opinion, not very wisely talk of them. But it is man's nature to affect such conventions, and we make a serious mistake if we draw a sharp distinction between the natural and the artificial in human affairs, and thereby ignore everything that man does in the world as we seek to understand his nature. Art is man's nature, Burke argues. We are, as much at least, in a state of nature, in formed manhood, as in immature and helpless infancy. The state of civil society is a state of nature, and much more truly so than a savage and incoherent mode of life. This blurring of the distinction between nature and artifice is a crucial move for Burke, distinguishing him sharply from Paine and other Enlightenment liberal theorists of his day. Burke shows, in David Bromwich's apt phrase, respect for society and nature as elements of a single human environment. As we have seen, the distinction between artifice and nature is crucial for Thomas Paine's view of the world, because he accuses the corrupt regimes, the aristocracies and monarchies, most especially of raising artificial barriers between nature and man, and therefore denying individual human beings the rights to which they are entitled by nature. A revolution, as Paine sees it, throws off all convention and reverts to the original conditions from which regimes emerge, to regenerate and begin again from the start. By denying the stark distinction between the natural and artificial or conventional, therefore, Burke closes off the possibility of such reversion. Regimes, he says, are built primarily on conventions and are natural in the sense that artistry and artifice are natural to man. A society cannot be grounded in rights that exist only outside of society. The pretended rights of man which have made this havoc, Burke writes, regarding the French Revolution in direct response to Paine in 1791, cannot be the rights of the people. For to be a people and to have these rights are things incompatible. The one supposes the presence 
the other the absence of a state of civil society. A people, therefore, cannot revert to a pre-social state in which such rights are in effect, because in doing so, they would cease to be a people. Burke continues, quote, The idea of a people is the idea of a corporation. It is wholly artificial and made like all other legal fictions by common agreement. When men, therefore, break up the original compact or agreement, which gives its corporate form and capacity to a state, they are no longer people. They have no longer a corporate existence. They have no longer a legal coactive force to bind within, nor a claim to be recognized abroad. They are a number of vague, loose individuals and nothing more. End quote. Paine's idea of revolution, therefore, seems to Burke a recipe for societal suicide because it relies on the presumption, which Burke takes to be false, that by the nature of things, the society will persist when its regime has been dissolved. In the wake of such a dissolution, Burke argues, there will be no rules or methods by which a new regime could form, no protections of property or persons, no reason to follow a leader or adhere to majority rule, no means for regenerating. In fact, Burke considers the very desire for such a regeneration of one's own society appalling. Quote, I cannot conceive how any man can have brought himself to consider his country as nothing but carte blanche, upon which he may scribble whatever he pleases, Burke writes. A man full of warm, speculative benevolence may wish his society otherwise constituted than he finds it, but a good patriot and a true politician always considers how, she, how he shall make the most of the existing materials of his country. We do not have it in our power to begin the world over again, Burke suggests. Building on existing forms using existing materials requires not an abstract study of nature, but a very particular understanding of the history and character of one's society. Because the state is conventional, and because the abstract rights of man do not provide explicit rules for political life directly, statesmanship is always a matter of prudence and experimental science, as Burke puts it. The results of such experiments do not become evident immediately, so that to learn from them takes time, often more than any single lifetime. For this reason, history, and not only nature, must inform political life, and existing political forms should not be abandoned lightly. This does not mean that history is always an honor roll of great and wise accomplishments. Human history, Burke writes in the Reflections on the Revolution in France, quote, consists for the most part of the miseries brought upon the world by pride, ambition, avarice, revenge, lust, sedition, hypocrisy, ungoverned zeal, and all the train of disorderly appetites, end quote. Uh, but it also consists of efforts to address these vices. And in both its best and worst manifestations, history offers lessons no statesman can afford to ignore. Burke thus disagrees profoundly with the method of argument and the notion of nature that informs Paine and the more radical liberal philosophers. But his inclination to present his views as critique of others tends to mask the positive teaching about nature that underlies Burke's argument. His sharp rejection of Paine's idea of nature begins to point toward his own very different idea. The Enlightenment philosophers, Burke worries, are so taken up with their theories about the rights of man that they have totally forgotten his nature. Burke is fairly specific as to what they miss about that nature, the part that is not simply matter in motion or reason in action. A politics oriented to man's nature understands man as an animal being, a rational being, and a creature of sympathies and sentiments. Paine and other radical liberal thinkers leave the human sentiments and the role of the imagination out of their understanding of human nature. By overemphasizing both the animal and the rational elements of man, Burke worries, they not only disregard but also undermine the sentiments that are in fact key to human nature and political order. The revolutionaries imagined that man was basically a rational animal so that if his simple needs for food and safety were met, his reason would govern him. 
Those he disagreed with, including Paine, did not, of course, deny that there were other parts to human nature, but Burke believed they had far too much faith in the ability of reason alone to govern those other elements, and especially the passions and sentiments. End outer quote. All right, so what we have seen here essentially is that is that Thomas Paine, and this goes as well for many other liberal theorists of that era, looks back to uh, a state of nature uh, before civilization, before society, some sort of raw, basic state of nature, and tries to infer from that state of nature uh, what rights men have. And Paine comes to this uh, individualist conclusion, um, and we'll see more as we explore some of the, the more particulars of what pain finds, but uh, Burke is saying that, no, uh, there is no pre-social state of nature. If you're going to understand man's nature, you have to understand it as a social being, as a person who, who in inclines toward organizing uh, themselves into social groups, social groupings, even as something as basic as the family. There is no non-social person. There, you know, uh, there might be a, a person who, you know, has gone off and lived in the woods, but they were still born to parents. There's no, there's no escaping some form of society. And so it's a, it's a rejection of the, of the perspective uh, that, that uh, a state of nature is, is going to be an escape from society. And then he goes into how uh, Paine finds uh, rash reason and rationality to be like the core components of man's nature and that through reason and through rationality one can arrive at uh, natural principles, natural rights, and things of that nature uh, without regarding um, the other components of human nature, such as sentimentality, and we'll get into in more detail in this book what he means by sentimentality, but the sorts, essentially the sorts of attachments that one person has to another. That's part of man's nature, to have attachments to people, and attachments to institutions, and attachments to ideas, and uh, these sorts of things are natural to man, and they're not something that man can simply cast off and, and, and create a rationalistic society. So that's the essence of that. Um, and then uh, we'll go into some more detail in this next section here. He, is, he begins to talk about uh, the historical inheritance of man. And this is a really interesting section. I think that this section is going to kind of um, begin to open up uh, the the point of the rest of the book and some of the important points that we'll be carrying with us forward into future books. Uh, the whole notion of inheriting society from our forefathers and what that means and what that implies and, and so forth. So uh, without any further ado, let me get right in here. Uh, he says, outer quote, a political system that gives up on the effort to educate man's natural sentiments to good ends would quickly degenerate into despotism because it would have no hold on its people's allegiance except the threat of force. On the scheme of this barbarous philosophy, Burke wrote in the Reflections, which is the offspring of cold hearts and muddy understandings, and which is as void of solid wisdom as it is destitute of all taste and elegance, laws are to be supported only by their own terrors. In the groves of their academy, at the end of every vista, you see nothing but the gallows. Nothing is left which engages the affections on the part of the commonwealth. Burke thus first rejects the radical appeal to nature as potentially ruinous, and then offers the beginning of a positive description of man's nature by reference to what exactly he believes might be ruined by the radicals. Man's reliance on his imagination to guide even his reason is a natural fact, crucially relevant to political life. A successful political order must protect and sustain the wardrobe of our moral imagination and never lose sight of its importance. <clears throat> 
but just how could such a political order be constructed and sustained over time? Thomas Paine's model of nature, after all, offered both means and ends for political action by holding up a particular understanding of nature, taken to be a set of rational rules that begin from individualism and equality, as the standard of legitimacy that should give shape to change over time. Burke's understanding of human nature offers reasons, including reasons grounded in a positive teaching about human nature, to worry about the actual consequences of applying Paine's model. But what does Burke's own alternative view have to say about political change? Here, Burke turns most explicitly to nature for an answer. While he denies that any particular political system is somehow natural to man, he believes that in thinking about how best to manage and guide political change over time, we would be wise to look to the model of how change happens in nature and to follow that model by choice. His model of nature is not Paine's system of rational rules akin to modern physics, but something more like the example of biological organisms transmitting their traits through the generations, a system of inheritance. In an extraordinary passage in the Reflections, Burke lays out how the natural example is crucial to his larger view of political life. Quote, By a constitutional policy, working after the pattern of nature, we receive, we hold, we transmit our government and our privileges in the same manner in which we enjoy and transmit our property and our lives. The institutions of policy... The goods of fortune, the gifts of providence, are handed down to us and from us in the same course and order. Our political system is placed in a just correspondence and symmetry with the order of the world, and with the mode of existence decreed to a permanent body composed of transitory parts, wherein, by the disposition of a stupendous wisdom molding together the great mysterious incorporation of the human race, the whole at one time is never old or middle-aged or young, but in a condition of unchangeable constancy, moves on through the varied tenor of perpetual decay, fall, renovation, and progression. Thus, by preserving the method of nature in the conduct of the state, in what we improve we are never wholly new, in what we retain we are never wholly obsolete. End quote. This analogy teaches us a great deal about Burke's view of nature. It points to his focus on the facts of birth and death and the need to manage change, decay, renovation, and progress. He has in mind, too, a kind of model of species rather than individuals, so that his appeal to nature, quite unlike Paine's, does not yield in individualism, but in a case for the implicit and inescapable embeddedness of every individual in a larger context. But Burke also clearly asserts that he sees this interpretation only as a model. This approach to politics is a kind of choice, not a natural fact. Parallels between nature and politics rather furnish similitudes to illustrate or adorn than supply analogies from which to reason. The English, Burke argues, choose to adhere to a model of nature a model of transmission and inheritance that enables gentle, gradual change in their political life. They may well have chosen otherwise, but they wisely follow the model of nature because it draws on some of the advantages apparent in the natural world for dealing with certain complicated and inescapable natural obstacles to progress. First and foremost among these obstacles, people are born and die, and so the human race is always threatened by discontinuities. By connecting the generations to one another rather than sending each all the way back to the first origins of man for information, Burke's model secures a mean of cultural transmission that takes account of the life cycle about which we human beings have no choice. It also enables responsible change. By always seeing ourselves as carrying forward and improving on an inheritance, 
Burke reasons, we need not feel like the first to do anything, and even new ideas can be fitted into the patterns of old ones, so that gradual innovations might bring improvements without the usual impudence of innovators. A sense of age and long standing also breeds respect and encourages peaceful and benevolent sentimental attachments to one's society. By this means, our liberty becomes a noble freedom. It carries an imposing and majestic aspect. It has a pedigree and illustrating ancestors. By treating existing political institutions and practices as an entailed inheritance, citizens learn to think of them as a kind of charge, a gift from the past that, preserved and suitably improved upon, is owed to the future, and therefore learn not to dismiss them lightly. Men are by nature drawn to novelty and excitement, Burke worries, and only by being stirred by the beauty of the given can they see its advantages, and so be appropriately skeptical and cautious about overturning it. The old and tried model will not always work, of course, but when it fails, societies would be wise to fix it by gradually building on what does work about it, rather than by starting fresh with an untried idea. Burke thus offers a model of gradual change, of evolution rather than revolution. In a sense, he sees tradition as a process with something of the character that modern biology ascribes to natural evolution. The products of that process are valuable not because they are old, but because they are advanced, having developed through years of trial and error and adapted to their circumstances. The approach to political life built on this model, which Burke often dubs prescription, is a way of adapting well-established practices and institutions to changing times, rather than starting over and losing the advantages of age and experience. This model of nature is by no means the whole of Burke's idea of prescription, as we will see, but it is the foundation of it. Burke, however, is not arguing for static adherence to past practices. On the contrary, he believes that contending with constant change is one of the great strengths of the natural world, in ways that human communities would do well to learn from. We must all obey the great law of change, Burke writes. It is the most powerful law of nature, and the means, perhaps, of its conservation. All we can do, and that human wisdom can do, is to provide that the change shall proceed by insensible degrees. This has all the benefits which may be in change without any of the inconveniences of mutation. And this is achieved by investing people in the given world on the model of nature. For Burke, therefore, nature offers not a source of principles and axioms, but a living model of change and one especially well suited to human nature with its reliance on imagination and the sentiments and to the natural facts of man's life and death. End out or quote. Okay, so this is really interesting. This is a connection between the principle of uh, evolution. Now, keep in mind, this was written well before Charles Darwin, uh, but the notion of, inher of inheritance, of inheriting the traits of your parents, was obvious even to uh, people before Darwin came along. The idea that a, a, a tall man and a tall woman will have a tall child, uh, or a, a blonde-haired parents will have a blonde-haired child, or what, what have you. The idea of, of inheriting things from generation to generation. And so Burke takes this notion of inheritance and begins to apply it to society. Uh, and institutions and traditions, basically saying that every generation inherits these institutions and traditions and is charged with improving them gently without overturning them and handing them to the next generation intact and perhaps improved. Uh, but as we saw in the, in, the, in the conflict of visions, this sort of notion, you one is not encouraged to presume to be capable of making vast improvements 
in the inherited institutions and traditions because one should not have the hubris or overconfidence to presume that one has the has the has a, a greater moral sense, a greater intelligence, more common sense, what have you, than all of the previous generations who have bit by bit made these gradual adjustments and passed them down. So that if you have humility, then you will do the same thing. You will make gradual adjustments and you will pass them on. And you won't overturn or make radical changes based on your own self-confidence that you know better than everybody who has come before you. And through this process of each person or each group of people, each institution or what have you, making these minor changes, that some of these minor changes will work well and some won't work well. And again, this is before Darwin, and so his, his notion is more that uh, you know that they'll be evaluated, and things that things that will work will be recognized as working, and and will spread, um, as opposed to just you know uh, passing on by its by its fundamental success or failure. Uh, and that's we mentioned that actually in a conflict of visions, as well. The sort of Hayekian view was was Hayek was after Darwin, and so his Hayek's perspective was more of a survival of the fittest when it came to. Uh, traditions and institutions. Burks is more of a uh, people evalu- evaluating the results of the things that their parents have done and that they have done uh, to determine what works well. Uh, but that's a that's a, a subtle difference, a minute difference. It's not extremely relevant. I think the reality provides uh, reality is a bit of both of those perspectives. But the ba- the basic sense here is that that, that this is a transmission of of culture from one generation to the next. And Burke calls this prescription. Um, and that means sort of pre-written. Uh, and, and we'll talk more as we go as to what he means by prescription in a little more detail. Um, and I suppose we'll get into that right now. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about prescription now. Uh, so uh, he says, quote, As we have seen... Burke argues that beginnings should be shrouded in a veil and that the results of the long chain of tradition and practice, results like stability, prosperity, allegiance, patriotism, and nobility, are what we must seek to protect. Thus, the long chain itself is to be guarded. But not because its origins were perfect, he says plainly that he does not believe they were, This is not Christian traditionalism. It is prescription, a very different and quite innovative way of thinking about social development. Burke turns out, therefore, to be neither a utilitarian proceduralist nor a natural law philosopher. He does not believe that man-made law is the final authority and that only consequences matter, nor does he believe that political life is an expression of unchanging Christian truths. The regime, he suggests, does not owe its legitimacy directly to God, and neither is every whim of the sovereign legitimate. He proposes rather a novel notion of political change that emerges from precisely his model of nature and his, again, rather novel idea of prescription. And yet, over time, this idea points us toward a standard of justice and judgment beyond pure utility. Burke does not differ with Paine's or the natural law school's view that a standard of justice must guide political life. He differs, rather, in his view of our ability to know and discover that standard. Paine argues that we can know the standard by rational deduction from the premises of our understanding of nature. So, for instance, our knowledge of pre-social man tells us that all men are equal in understanding that must define political life. The natural law tradition argues that we can know the standard through philosophical reflection on theological or philosophical premises, many of them evident in the functioning of nature. Burke, however, is far more skeptical of our ability to discover and apply directly this higher standard of justice in politics. The higher standard is not directly accessible to reason, he argues, 
because human beings generally cannot reason directly about abstract ideas without some imaginative context, and because social life is not the simple playing out of pre-social natural premises. Burke's view of nature and of human nature suggests to him that the standards of justice that are to guide political life are rather discoverable, to the extent that we can know them at all, implicitly through the experience of political life itself. Burke believes, therefore, that the traditions embodied in England's social and political institutions, what he describes as the English Constitution, built as they are on the model of natural generation, are the best means available for his countrymen to reach a transcendent standard for government. He acknowledges that the constitutional tradition does not speak with one voice and cannot be traced back to a simple set of original principles that rely on man's beginnings to define his rights. But it does offer, in the norms it builds up, though always with exceptions, an approach by degrees to a real standard beyond mere convention. This view is neither natural law philosophy nor a standardless utilitarianism. Grounded in Burke's natural model of change, this approach respects traditional practices not because they began a long time ago, but because they have survived and evolved through a process of trial and error for a long time. Prescription, which improves society by building upon its strengths, with its analogy of nature, makes this trial and error possible and helps us distinguish error from success. It is indeed a model of change, but one suited to help us discern the general shape of some permanent underlying principles of justice. The historical experience of social and political life consists in essence of a kind of rubbing up against the principles of natural justice, and the institutions and practices that survive the experience thereby take on something of the shape of those principles, because only those that have this shape do survive. Over time, therefore, provided they develop in accordance with the model of prescription, societies come to express in their institutions, their charters, their traditions, and their habits a simulacrum of the standard of justice. Society, as it exists after such long experience, therefore offers an approximation of society as it should exist. Social and political change can help to bring a society slowly closer to the standard, if only by degrees, but such progress is likely to happen only if the change is in keeping with the spirit of society's pre-existing models and orders since they offer the only real sense we can have of what the sought-after standard looks like. We should seek to emulate our ancestors, Burke argues, who, by looking backward as well as forward, went on insensibly drawing this constitution nearer and nearer to its perfection, by never departing from its fundamental principles, nor introducing any amendment which had not a subsisting root in the laws, constitution, and usages of the kingdom. Burke, in this sense, is not a backward-looking, but a forward-looking traditionalist. He believes that the present is better than the past, and he is committed to sustaining the means by which it has become better, to facilitate further improvement. The best kind of political change, in Burke's view, builds on what is best about the given world to improve what is worst about it, and leaves society as it was, but more so. This is the best sort of change, not because our conventional institutions define the standards of our politics, but because the conventions that have survived the test of time are those that somehow answer to that standard. This great law does not arise from our conventions or compacts. On the contrary, it gives to our conventions and compacts all the force and sanction they can have. This is the reason prescription is such an effective model of change. Over time, it mellows into legality governments that were violent in their commencement. Social change can thus be generally ameliorative if it is properly managed, though it is not simply progressive. It does not move in only one direction. Burke's idea of a just society is not an end state that is the ultimate goal of all political change. 
Rather, a just society provides space for thriving private lives and a thriving national life within the bounds of the Constitution by allowing for some balance of order and freedom. Political life occurs within that space, and political change sustains and defends that space and therefore moves in various directions as events warrant, sometimes restraining or strengthening one element of the Constitution and sometimes another. Political change helps to slowly draw the Constitution toward its perfection, but the change is far from linear and never simple. Precisely because of the generational character of human societies, political change cannot achieve a genuine perfection. Thus, societies are always contending with the most basic flaws of human nature. Those cannot be overcome because we humans are always human, even as our social institutions improve with, with time as we learn from experience. The statesman's task is therefore not to drive society toward some particular ultimate and just condition, but to create and constantly sustain a space in which the people may exercise their freedom and enjoy the benefits of life in society. Successful political change, in Burke's view, is thus utterly continuous with a society's past and character. To plan, manage, judge, and carry off such successful change therefore requires a profound understanding of the history, the spirit, the norms, the practices, and the traditions of one's society. And a successful politics is guided by this kind of understanding, which goes by the name of prudence. Prudence is not the opposite of either principle or theory. Prudence, rather, is the application of general experience to particular practical problems. In Burke's view, the per prudent person believes that the experience of our society generally points to underlying principles of justice and of nature, and so offers more reliable, if less specific, guidance than do abstract theories like natural rights liberalism that Paine would import wholesale into practical politics, end quote. All right, so that is a cool section there. He goes more into prescription, and he's talking basically, he, you know, this sounds a lot a lot like that same sort of survival of the fittest type of thing, that, that as society deals with the various challenges that come up over time, it responds bit by bit to these environmental uh, scenarios and takes and, and, and slowly becomes a more uh, advanced shape, more closely reflecting the underlying principles of justice. The theory is that we can't just we can't just figure out what justice is by contemplating it. It's that's not possible. We we learn it through experience. All of our all of our understanding of theories comes from our experiences. We infer what justice is through our experiences. We don't sit and contemplate and discover it in our minds. We discover it through trial and error as our activities rub up against reality and take the shape of justice as we learn and we grow wiser. That's the premise of prescription. So the very fact that a society has been around for a long time doesn't just mean that it's old. It means that it has been through a multitude of challenges and has shaped itself in a way that is sustainable and is just and uh, and is workable. And so that's the basic premise of prescription. And I think that's uh, a critical component of conservatism. And I think it's nice to really get in and and explore that, put it in words, and and put it out there so that we can we can begin to we can begin to kind of find the ways in which conservatism and naturalism sort of align with each other. And this is, I think, one of the core ways that, that the naturalistic approach of cause and effect and subtle changes over time and the whole evolutionary process is, is or, or can be duplicated in political life. And so that's uh, that's that. Now, we're going to begin to move on. Okay, so at this point, I want to move on to a different discussion when he talks about democracy and he talks about consent. Uh, 
Uh, we'll talk more about consent in the future. I think it's really important, uh, but we'll, we're going to start to dig into that uh, right here. He says, outer quote, Under a cruel king, Burke argues, members of an oppressed minority have the balmy compassion of mankind to assuage the smart of their wounds. But under a tyrannical democracy, the public as a whole is against them. They seem deserted by mankind, overpowered by a conspiracy of their whole species. Their oppression seems somehow legitimated. On top of this tyranny of the majority, and perhaps an even greater th threat to legitimate government, is the danger of arbitrary rule in a democracy, of the government never having to answer for its actions because they are carried out in the name of the people. In his appeal from the new Whigs to the old. Burke quotes at length Paine's case that election is the only legitimate source of authority, and then paraphrases the attitude he sees in it. Quote, discuss any of their schemes. Their answer is, it is the act of the people and that is sufficient. Are we to deny to a majority of the people the right of altering even the whole frame of their society, if such should be their pleasure. They may change it, say they, from a monarchy to a republic today, and tomorrow back again from a republic to a monarchy, and so backward and forward as often as they like." End quote. If there is no source of authority but this moment's popular will, then no arrangements or institutions of society can be expected to remain in place one moment longer than the majority wishes them there. This, Burke argues, is not only impractical, as it would lead to a debilitating uncertainty and make it impossible for any citizen to plan his future, but also an error in principle. Neither the few nor the many have a right to act merely by their will in any matter connected with duty, trust, engagement, or obligation. It makes no difference if a majority chooses it or not, as no one of us men can dispense with public or private faith or with any other tie of moral obligation, so neither can any number of us. There are crucial instances when choice is simply not an option. And here we come to the heart of Burke's trouble with consent. While the threats to the English Constitution and the risk of majority tyranny worry him. The more profound and fundamental problem, Burke argues, is that the focus on choice amounts to a fundamental misunderstanding of the human condition. A politics of choice begins in error. As Burke sees it, each man is in society not by choice, but by birth. And the facts of his birth, his family, the station, and the nation he is born into, exert inescapable demands on him while also granting him some privileges and protections that the newborn has, of course, done nothing to earn. Men can change their circumstances and can garner or lose privileges and obligations in the course of their lives, but even when they do so, they take on, in their new stations, new obligations that are not simply chosen and cannot simply be discarded at will. The place of every man determines his duty. The most essential human obligations and relations, especially those involving the family, but also many of those involving community, the nation, and one's religious faith, are not chosen and could never really be chosen. And political and social life begins from these, not from an act of will. We have obligations to mankind at large, which are not in consequence of any special voluntary pact Burke writes, they arise from the relation of man to man and the relation of man to God, which relations are not matters of choice. On the contrary, the force of all the pacts which we enter into with any particular person or number of persons among mankind depends upon those prior obligations. In some cases, these subordinate relations are voluntary, in others they are necessary, but the duties are all compulsive. Only by beginning one's theory of politics from a highly implausible thought experiment about perfectly independent people founding a society by choice, can one imagine a society in which choice is utterly central. When one looks at how human beings actually live, it is impossible 
to ignore the centrality and the value of compulsory obligations. Perhaps the most perfectly inescapable fact about how we live is that all human beings enter a world that already exists. A world in which they belong to a particular family and community that are responsible for them and toward which they in turn have obligations. Payne's error, Burke suggests, begins with a flawed notion of original freedom and independence. In The Appeal from the New to the Old Whigs, in direct response to Payne, Burke reveals the heart of his own anthropology with an extraordinary depiction of human relations. It is quite possibly the most important paragraph in Burke's decades of writing, and so is worth quoting at length. Quote, Dark and inscrutable are the ways by which we come into the world. The instincts which give rise to this mysterious process of nature are not of our making, but out of physical causes unknown to us, perhaps unknowable, arise moral duties, which as we are able perfectly to comprehend, we are bound indispensably to perform. Parents may not be consenting to their moral relation, but consenting or not, they are bound to a long train of birthsome duties towards those with whom they have never made a convention of any sort. Children are not consenting to their relation, but their relation without their actual consent binds them to its duties, or rather it implies their consent because the presumed consent of every rational creature is in unison with the predisposed order of things. Men come in that manner into a community with the social state of their parents, endowed with all the benefits, loaded with all the duties of their situation. If the social ties and ligaments spun out of those physical relations, which are the elements of the commonwealth, in most cases begin and always continue independently of our will, so without any stipulation on our part are we bound by that relation called our country, which comprehends, as it has well been said, all the charities of all. Nor are we left without powerful instincts to make this duty as dear and grateful to us as it is awful and coercive." End quote. Just as Paine's understanding of rights and choice sit at the heart of his political thought, so this vision of obligations not chosen, but nevertheless binding, forms the very core of Edmund Burke's moral and political philosophy. An enormous portion of Burke's and the conservative worldview becomes clearer in light of the importance he places on the basic facts and character of human procreation, and an enormous portion of pains and the progressive worldview becomes clearer in light of the desire he evinces to be liberated from the implications of those facts and that character. Almost all of what we loosely call the social issues have to do with the dispute about whether such liberation is possible and desirable, and, because it raises the question of the relation between generations, that dispute also shapes a surprising portion of our other prominent debates. Burke takes the human person to be embedded in a web of obligations that give shape to our lives. The role of consent in this view of society is secondary at best. Social relations flow out of natural relations, and consent is assumed where it cannot be expressed. Not because the individual chooses to accept his obligations, but because the consent of every rational creature is assumed to be in line with the predisposed order of things. This vision of society begins with the family, not the individual, and moves up toward society. End outer quote. So this section is really nice. Uh, we get into some of the real challenge between consent and uh, and uh, and ob and un un unconsented obligation, um, given obligation, because you're born into a certain scenario. You're born into a family. You're born to parents. You're born to siblings. Now, we have a natural inclination toward. Uh, bonding together with our family unit, um, bonding to our parents, parents bonding to their children. These are natural urges. Parents bond to their children not because they've chosen to do so. They might think that they've chosen to do so, but it's a natural drive. 
You know, presuming you're a healthy individual, you're going to bond with your children. We've always done so. It's, it's not rooted in consent or choice. It's rooted in nature and natural obligations that, that we feel for each other. And we're, we're born into a particular time, into a particular socioeconomic status, a particular country, uh, a particular social class within that, I mean, the, the, a particular gender, a particular et cetera, et cetera. Maybe you're tall, maybe you're ugly, whatever. You're born with certain things that you haven't consented to that affect your relations with the rest of the world. It's a, it's a, the, the world that you're born into is an entire web of social relations and you're not born into that unconnected. You're born into the web already connected. You're already part of it when you're born. Th those connections aren't chosen. Now, you can choose to sever them. Uh, in some cases, it, it may be easier than in others. Uh, and, and, you know, pain makes the argument that because you haven't severed it, then therefore you consent to it. But it's not so simple as that. Because again, this draws back to this sort of pre-social nature of man, that the true person is an individual devoid of these connections. And so you as an individual have the ultimate sovereignty and, you're, and you can choose to, to maintain or eliminate. But even as Burke says, even as you eliminate a social connection, other social connections rise to take its place. You, you move from one station in life into another station in life that will come with its own obligations. It's, it's, it's in direct contrast with nature and human nature to continually struggle against this social fabric. So that's basically Burke's perspective is that his whole, and then the, the, he, it also, he talks about democracy a little bit in the beginning there. Um, I didn't talk too much about democracy in that section that I quoted, but essentially democracy is fundamentally rooted in choice and consent. Um, and so pure democracy says that we have the we have the right to take everything that we have inherited thus far and and completely toss it in the trash bin if we choose to do so. Uh, where that's our right to do that. Uh, but that presumes that you don't owe the next generation anything that that you can inherit a thousand year civilization and then decide, well, our civilization is fundamentally evil and therefore we are going to allow it to be overrun, allow it to fade into obscurity. Uh, our, our, our children don't have the opportunity to inherit that which we have inherited um, because we have the choice to dismiss it all. Uh, that's when he talks about you can go from a monarchy to a republic to a monarchy to a republic. You can, you can do, every generation has the capacity to completely rewrite their constitution, completely rebuild their society, uh, however they choose. It's, 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 I mean, the, the concept of choice, perfectly, perfectly free choice, and, and the concept of, um, of a priori obligations, uh, those two things are opposed. And you, we, we now, you know, it, you, you're, we, we kind of have to live somewhere in between them. We don't want to live in a world where people have no choice whatsoever. And I don't think that Burke argues for that in any way. He argues for people ha to have the choice to be able to make the modifications necessary. But he doesn't put choice at the center of our society or of our lives or of our premise of justice. He puts obligation and intergenerational continuity and social networks uh, at the core. So that's all pretty interesting stuff. Uh, and let's keep moving on here. Um, so I want to get to a bit here. He talks about, oh, let's see. He talks a little bit more about prescription and he talks about reason and rationality and the limits of human reason as applied to politics uh, this is right along the lines of the same things that we've been talking about. Um, so he says, oh, let's see. Uh, all right. So he says, outer quote, he says, Edmund Burke's belief in the complexity of human nature and the insufficiency of choice leads him to be far more skeptical than most of his peers about reasons potential for guiding political action. 
Burke routinely mocks the idea that the radical's rationalism has unleashed a great enlightenment upon the hitherto dark world. Having read, as he puts it, more than he can justify to anything but the spirit of curiosity of the works of these illuminators of the world, Burke reports himself perplexed at their claims to a new path to wisdom. Where the old authors whom he has read and the old men whom he has conversed with have left him in the dark, he is in the dark still. There is more to this than a sarcastic jab at self-appointed beacons of reason. Burke believes that Enlightenment liberals and radicals' emphasis on human reason begins from a misunderstanding of human nature, the mistaking of a part for the whole. Politics ought to be adjusted not to human reasonings, but to human nature, of which the reason is but a part, and by no means the greatest part. By ignoring the greater parts, especially the sentiments and attachments that move people in politics, one misses the most important factors behind political actions and social attachments. Many of the greatest challenges a statesman must confront arise from the less rational elements of the human character. Governing is, of course, a rational activity, and political thought must certainly be guided by some general principles, but it's a mistake to assume that effective principles can be drawn from abstract premises rather than actual experience. The general must be derived from the particular, not the other way around. It seems to me a preposterous way of reasoning and a perfect confusion of ideas to take the theories which learned and speculative men have made from the practice of government and then, supposing it made on those theories which were made from it to accuse government as not corresponding with them. This confusion of the relationship between theory and practice in politics can have dangerous consequences, Burke warns, because as political life becomes an enactment of a theory rather than a response to particular social needs and wants, it becomes unmoored both from the ends that should guide politics and from the limits that should restrain it. He believes that the importation of theory too directly into political life is among the foremost errors, both of the British government in its dealings with America in the late 1770s and of the revolutionaries in France a decade later. Again and again, he warns against mistaking politics for metaphysics, and he describes his concerns in terms of three distinct but closely related worries. First, Burke believes that the attempt to apply what he calls metaphysical methods in politics confuses politicians and citizens about the purpose of politics, leading them to think that governing is about proving a point rather than advancing the interests and happiness of a nation. The trouble is not that principles do not belong in politics. On the contrary, Burke writes, I do not put abstract ideas wholly out of any question, because I well know that under that name I should dismiss principles, and that without the guide and light of sound, well-understood principles, all reasonings in politics as in everywhere else would only be a confused jumble of particular facts and details without the meaning of without the means of drawing out any sort of theoretical or practical conclusion. <coughs> Rather, the problem is the insistence on abstract precision in political questions, and thus on measuring practice by fine theoretical metrics. This insistence can confuse us about what the purpose of politics actually is. Government is a practical thing, made for the happiness of mankind, Burke writes, not to gratify the schemes of visionary politicians. It runs into trouble, therefore, when statesmen split and animatize the doctrine of free government as if it were an abstract question concerning metaphysical liberty and necessity and not a matter of moral prudence and natural feeling. He goes on to say, quote, The success of policy must be measured in practice, not by its adherence, to a speculative theory. A statesman differs from a professor in a university 
Burke remarked in a 1781 speech, the latter has only the general view of society. The former, the statesman, has a number of circumstances to combine with these general ideas and to take into his consideration. This difference points to Burke's second great concern about theory in politics, which is that theory often ignores circumstances and particulars crucial to the success of policy and the happiness of society. Theory is general and universal, but politics must always be very particular. Circumstances, which with some gentlemen pass for nothing, give in reality to every political principle its distinguishing color and discriminating effect. These circumstances are what render every civil and political scheme beneficial or noxious to mankind. In this respect, politics is more, not less, precise than theory. It is concrete and particular. And Burke believes that concrete characteristics, needs, and interests are undermined when politics is turned into a kind of applied metaphysics. When statesmen practice such abstraction, they fail to know their people. And this failure translates into practice as a failure to account for crucial differences and attachments, which Burke deemed essential to political life. Rather than govern the people through their native or organically emergent categories and distinctions, Burke writes, the radicals in France seek to confound all sorts of citizens as well as they could into one homogeneous mass, and then they divided this, their amalgama, into a number of incoherent republics. He has in mind a decision of the Revolutionary Assembly to divide France into perfectly square districts rather than govern its traditional regions. The eradication of traditional attachments and practices that would follow such a move, and that indeed was its purpose, would not eliminate prejudices and attach the people to their national identity as the revolutionaries hoped. Instead, Burke argues, it would crush all attachment to community and leave an unrestrained Paris government in charge of a greatly weakened nation. In these protestations against the rational eradication of traditional distinctions, we find a hint of Burke's essential moderation, which rejected not only chaos, but also an excess of order. Reductive theories of politics seem to him an almost despotic force in society. They first undid all existing arrangements, weakening the people beyond repair, and then imposed an artificial order unconnected and ill-suited to the character of those being governed. And in this radical rearrangement, he feared, were the seeds of an unrestrained political extremism, employing society as a kind of metaphysical laboratory. That very fear points to the third concern Burke has about theory and politics. He is concerned that an over-reliance on theory may unleash extremism and immoderation by unmooring politics from the polity. Their principles always go to the extreme, Burke writes, of the radicals of his day. Because they pursue the vindication of a principle, they cannot stop short of total success. Even when their aims are well conceived, the radicals will not accept a good thing if it does not come up to the full perfection of the abstract idea. And instead, they will push for the more perfect, which cannot be attained without tearing to pieces the whole contexture of the commonwealth. Burke believed that when the perfect is thus made the enemy of the good, political life can never be satisfactory, since there is no perfection in politics. The quest for theoretical perfection is thus in practice a pursuit of extremes. And precisely because the pursuit is empowered by sophisticated theories, its extremism resists restraint. Old-fashioned grievances, moved by local or national loyalties or material necessities, have their natural bounds. Old-fashioned despotism, moved by a naked desire for power on the part of of a charismatic tyrant cannot readily mask its excesses. But a mob moved by a theory has no natural stopping point and cannot easily be assuaged, and leaders claiming to advance a truth 
obtained by philosophical speculation do not fit the familiar profile of the tyrant. The ancient tyrants could only wish to get away with what the modern speculative revolutionaries can achieve. In the pursuit of such extremes, moreover, the fidelity of the people to society is always in question. Those vexatious questions, which, in truth, rather belong to metaphysics than politics, Burke writes, can never be moved without shaking the foundations of the best governments that have ever been constituted by human wisdom. When politics becomes a means of playing out speculative premises, every political practice, institution, and allegiance must explain itself in philosophical terms, so that no long-standing tradition, institution, or cherished habit can resist the searing light of speculative analysis. A politics built on modern reason inevitably becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Rejecting all that cannot explain itself in terms of modern reason, and therefore leaving in place only those elements of political life that meet its standards, regardless of what society may actually need or what has proven capable of serving the community in years gone by, by seeking a generalized theoretical precision in politics, ignoring circumstances and particulars, and unleashing a spirit of extremism, the speculative method of the Enlightenment radicals threatens to break the links between human nature and political life, as Burke understands them. And it does all this on the back of a notion of human reason that vastly exaggerates the capacity of the individual mind to discern political truths directly. Beyond his concern about importing the methods of speculative philosophy into politics, therefore, Burke expresses profound concern about the concept of reason at the heart of these methods. An individual rational faculty that on its own, drawing upon evident principles derived from reflections on nature, can assess the truth or falsehood of any proposition and apply general rules to every circumstance. This modern ideal of reason, Burke fears, partakes far too much in the modern myth of individualism, suggesting that every truth must be demonstrable to the rational individual. On the contrary, Burke argues, human reason, important as it is, is far more limited than this ideal suggests, and those limits point human beings rather to their mutual dependence than to a radical individualism. The nature of reason, including its limits, is crucial to understanding the proper means of political thought and action." End quote. All right, so that was a fairly long section that we just re read there about human reason and the limits of human reason. Uh, and about, and, and you know, I, I just want to say, like, when we when we look at Edmund Burke and the arguments that he made, obviously this is um, over 200 years old when he wrote this. This was around the time of the founding of the of, of America, around the time of the French Revolution in the late 1800s, you know, 1790 something. When uh, I'm not sure exactly when. Re reflections on the revolution in France. It was written during the revolution, so it's a, it was written around 1790, 1791, something like that. Um, so the politics and the and the problems and the situations that we face today, no, they're not going to be exactly the same. Um, and but but some of the underlying themes can still be applied to modern politics because. We find today that it's not necessarily that the that the progressive left is attempting to apply this real strict vision of reason and rationality to uh, to politics. Not not exactly. It's 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 a more of a moral certainty uh, that the progressives believe that that this is the correct way to be. They have ascertained this this advanced morality that must be imposed, that the, the liberal order is the morally correct, ra the rationally co correct version of society that must be imposed both domestically and internationally 
to to expand the the global liberal order, expand democracy, for example, that democracy is the one true correct method of government, and we need to spread and advance the cause of democracy across the world. It's it's similar. It's not exactly the same, but the underlying concept of applying metaphysical or theoretical principles about what justice is, about what truth is, about what the best way of acquiring uh, a stable society, about what sovereignty means, who should be sovereign, these various kind of, uh, po it's like political philosophy. And, and I, I'm, I'm interested in political philosophy. I read it. But at some point, you have to say, look, you can't just take a, philo a philosophy that you've conceived and just plug it in and try to shape all of society. Like when he talks about taking France and taking these uh, these traditional regions of France that have developed over many centuries, uh, these, these cultural distinctions between this province or that province and what the tenor of the provinces are and what the, the, the di different dialects and different methods of doing things, different sets of allegiances, uh, and, and, the, and the, the revolutionaries in Paris just saying, no, we're going to make a grid, we're going to superimpose a grid on France, and we're going to rule the different districts in that way, these square districts uh, with no connection to the actual lives of the people who live in those districts. The, the, the bonds between people uh, are totally irrelevant. It's, it's, it's all in the name of some sort of efficiency and, and in the name of, of weakening the, the local ties in order hypothetically to strengthen the, the tie of the people to their nation rather than their province. But the, the same principle can be applied globally in order to D diminish the natural uh, bound, uh, uh, bonds between members of different nations. It's the, it's the same thing could hypothetically be applied under the under the uh, the the, gl the global rule of reason and rationality and the dismissal of all particular uh, attachments. So anyway, um, we're going to move right along here. Uh, this next section, he continues to talk about uh, reason and rationality f uh, for a, a little bit more here in another section that I think is, is interesting. So he says, outer quote, if the premises of enlightenment liberalism are inadequate, and if the resulting faith in modern reason is unjustified, what is the alternative organizing principle of and the appropriate means for thinking about political change? Burke's answer draws on all that we have seen of his critique of speculative politics, his emphasis on the given, and his understanding of human nature. It is prescription, Burke's great anti-innovationist innovation. The term prescription originated in Roman property law, where it referred to ownership by virtue of long-term use rather than by formal deed. Burke uses the term to describe the means by which practices and institutions that have long served society well are given the benefit of the doubt against innovations that might undermine them and are used as patterns and models for political life. In this way, reforms and innovations are judged by their conformity to and continuity with existing political forms. Burke's case for this novel concept is firmly grounded in his sense of the limits of individual reason. Generations of statesmen have dealt with the kinds of challenges the present age must face, and if we do not take to our aid the foregone studies of men reputed intelligent and learned, we shall always be beginners. Humility before the wisdom of the past, however, does not mean just learning from the arguments that great men of prior generations made in writing and speech. Their legacy is the nation itself, its institutions, practices, and forms, all of which are the result of the thoughts of many minds in many ages. Prescription, therefore, means, above all, respecting and preserving the political order as it has been handed down, 
and even according it reverence. Prescription thus begins in a kind of humble gratitude. Because building a working political arrangement is extremely difficult, we who inherit one such arrangement should be grateful for it even when we cannot fully understand the sources of its success. In any effort at reform, Burke writes, I set out with a perfect distrust of my own abilities, a total renunciation of every speculation of my own, and with a profound reverence for the wisdom of our ancestors, who have left us the inheritance of so happy a constitution and so flourishing an empire. To approach the constitution, as the radicals do, with an eye to measuring it against a speculative theory, and no inherent regard for its established forms, is to prefer one's own reason over the collective wisdom of generations of one's countrymen. The French revolutionaries made precisely this mistake, Burke argues. Addressing himself to them in the reflections, he writes that while the old regime had terrible flaws, it also contained the seeds of possible improvement. Quote, you began ill because you began by despising everything that belonged to you. You set up your trade without capital. If the last generations of your country appeared so much without luster in your eyes, you might have passed them by and derived your claims from a more early race of ancestors. Under a pious predilection for those ancestors, your imaginations would have realized in them a standard of virtue and wisdom beyond the vulgar practice of the hour, and you would have risen up with the example to whose imitation you aspired. Respecting your forefathers, you would have been taught to respect yourselves." End quote. Burke thus does not argue that the English Constitution itself is an ideal regime for all, but rather that each society ought to draw on the best of its own tradition in addressing challenges and problems. The French should appreciate the past successes of their own fathers rather than abandon their ancestors' accomplishments in favor of a theoretical ideal. The temptation to do otherwise is great, Burke acknowledges. It is human nature to lose sight of the value of what we possess and be taken instead with the potential of what we imagine possible. It is therefore necessary to awaken in the people an appreciation for what they have and should not take for granted, and even to build up some pride in resisting reckless innovation. End outer quote. Uh, so yeah, then he gets a little bit more into the description and the definition of prescription, um, uh, and really just just all other things being equal, to prefer the old to the new to prefer the established to the experimenter, experimental. Uh, and to me, that makes a lot of sense. The things that exist, exist for a reason. You never know what's going to happen when you make changes. Uh, as Jordan Peterson has stated, uh, it's very easy to ruin things and very difficult to improve them. Take a painting. You go, I mean, this is, you know... Just another of my metaphors, but it's it's kind of appropriate, I think. If you if it's an example of, of this premise. If you if you approach a painting and you say, I'm gonna try to improve it, you gotta be a really good painter to improve it. You know, if if it's say the Mona Lisa, I'm gonna re I'm gonna paint a new version of the Mona Lisa, but better. You better be a darn good painter. But to paint a new version of the Mona Lisa that's uglier, that's worse, that, that's real easy. To break a statue is real easy. To break anything is easy, for the most part, much more easy than improving it. And so when we look at reform, we better do so pretty carefully with an eye to the consequences. That's the general premise of prescription, to prefer the given to, to the innovative. And I really like his, his little comment here when he's speaking directly to the French revolutionaries, basically saying, you know, you started this on the wrong foot because you despised everything that was yours. You despised all of your inheritance. And not only did you despise the generations that 
uh, exist now or in power now or your re- recent generations of leadership. But you could have looked back deeper to an older inheritance if you didn't like the most recent one and drew upon that. There are There's a, pl- a plethora of things to draw on in the history of your civilization to say everything that has come before is dark, is the, is the remnants of a dark age, but we, with our superior powers of reason and our superior moral certitude are opening up a new age of enlightenment from all of the darkness of the past. It's, it's so arrogant and it's largely, um, it's dangerous because, again, you don't know with any certainty that you're actually going to be capable of improving what is and you don't necessarily know if you if you despise what is if you despise the given but you don't really understand why things are the way they are why the decisions were made to to lead society into the direction in which it currently is then you don't really know what the ramifications are going to be when you knock the whole thing down or when you dismiss those things that have uh that have upheld the stability of society so so uh there's that let's move on uh the next section here uh we begin to talk about order uh and eternal order this section is entitled burke's eternal order and and uh i think this is pretty interesting as well so outer quote he says because pain believes that the rights and freedoms of the individual are at the core of political life, he argues that positive inheritance is almost entirely burdensome. What we owe the future is freedom, which is also what we must demand from the past. Politics, in this sense, exists for the sake of the present. It allows present citizens to legislate for themselves, free of impositions from their ancestors, and it will allow future citizens to do the same. This temporal individualism is at the heart of Paine's liberalism. Beginning from a very different premise, Edmund Burke comes to an entirely different view of the appropriate relations between the generations. His own understanding of politics puts not abstract natural freedom but concrete inheritance at the very core and emphasizes obligation over choice. Burke believes that what we owe the future above all is not freedom, but rather the accumulated wisdom and work of the past. The task of any generation is to preserve and, where necessary and possible, improve what that generation has been given by its predecessors, with the aim of passing the benefit along to its successors. Each generation must live with a sense of its own time as transitory, more or less the opposite of an eternal now. As noted, Burke sees society as a relationship not just between the living, but also between the living, the dead, and the people of the future. Society exists not to facilitate individual choice, but to meet the needs of the people. And to do so, it must draw on the wisdom of the past and be guided by the imperative to make that wisdom available to future generations as well, supplemented by lessons learned by the current generation along the way. A great deal of Burke's work is built on this sense that the present is fleeting and best understood as a link in a chain, and his focus on this question grows especially pronounced in the years of the French Revolution. Burke believes that the the present generation has profound obligations, both to the past and to the future, and that these obligations offer an important benefit to the present generation by imposing crucial constraints upon its ambitions and its reach. Society can thrive only within such constraints, and therefore with a sense of itself as linked to the past and the future. Without these constraints, all the lessons of history would be denied to the present and the future, and personal self-sufficiency and arrogance, the certain attendance upon all those who have never experienced a wisdom greater than their own, would usurp the tribunal. Burke expressly denies that we can look out for the needs of the future, even as we reject the lessons and achievements of the past. 
access to those lessons and achievements is one of the most crucial needs of the future as he sees it. So the present-centered vision of the revolutionaries must involve betraying the future as much as the past. People will not look forward to posterity who never look backward to their ancestors. A free and ordered society will look to both, Burke argues. Quote, one of the first and most leading principles upon which the commonwealth and the laws are consecrated is lest the temporary possessors and life renters in it, unmindful of what they have received from their ancestors or of what is due to their posterity, should act as if they were the entire masters, that they should not think it amongst their rights to cut off the entail or commit waste on the inheritance by destroying at their pleasure the whole original fabric of their society, hazarding to leave to those who come after them a ruin instead of a habitation, and teaching these successors as little respect to their contrivances as they had themselves respected the institutions of their forefathers. In order to build anything lasting, Burke suggests, we must respect what has been built in the past and how it has come down to us, end quote. So yeah, that's you know more about these this uh, perpetual link from one generation to the next that you that you you can't view your your capacity to do whatever you want because you have a duty to uh, to the future. You have a duty to the future generations to ensure that the teachings and lessons of the past are carried on through your generation and with the wisdom acquired in your generation supplementing these these traditions to pass down to future generations. You don't have the right to destroy society because you choose to do so and leave your future generations just the rubble and ruin of your civilization because you decided in your particular generation, your one link in this ongoing chain, you decided to smash the whole thing. You don't have that right. You have an obligation to your children and you have an obligation to your parents and to your, you know, your ancestors and your descendants to carry that torch from your birth to your death to pass it on to the next generation. That is the link and connection between generations so that society is not yours. You don't, you're not the whole, like if you look at the entirety of a civilization, it doesn't belong to any one generation. There's no one generation that th th this, this society belongs to them. The society belongs to all the generations until from its beginning to its, its, its end, like the Roman Empire or whatever. I mean, every civilization and society will ultimately end and, and be replaced by something else, presumably. I mean, that's how it's always been. But, but you know, every person, every, every, every generation has a duty to attempt to maintain that society in as in as good a condition as possible so i like that that's that's to me that's natural that's the natural order in the same sense that every living thing has a biological drive to procreate to pass the genetic code which it has inherited every person inherits a genetic code from their parents makes modifications to it through the mutation process and has a biological imperative to attempt to pass that genetic code on. And we have the same obligation and duty, although it may not be quite as ingrained in our, in our uh, behavioral patterns, our, our instincts, if you will, we still have that duty to pass on the society and to preserve and to uphold the society and to improve the society that we have because we are only one generation in a in a in a world of countless generations of humans uh so the last section i've read a lot of sections here um it's just i mean this book really just opens up edmund burke's philosophies in such a clear concise way it's a great book so yeah i've read a lot of sections and this is probably uh, one of my longer podcasts, uh, but the very at the very end, he talks about he returns again to the 
the givenness of the world. He says, quote, anyone exploring the views of Burke and Paine will repeatedly encounter, as we have, the question of context, both social and generational. Again and again, Paine defends the prerogatives of the individual and derides all that presses upon his freedom of action. Again and again, Burke insists that no man is an island and no individual exists apart from society. Two sets of concerns, those regarding the individual and the community, and those regarding the present and the past, are therefore constant themes of both Burke's and Paine's political thought. Paine believes that human beings are best understood apart from the community and the past as complete and sufficient individuals endowed with natural rights whose interactions are functions of their individual choices and actions. Both tradition and society should be put aside when contemplating questions of political principle and action, because both are consequences of politics, not sources of it. Burke believes that human beings are best understood in their historical and social settings, as members of their communities, with obligations to each other, and as the recipients of a valuable inheritance from the past, an inheritance that they are charged to improve and pass along. But as we review the particulars of the burke Payne debate laid out in the previous chapters, these two sets of concerns about tradition and community appear to collapse into one. The argument over tradition and the past encompasses the dispute over community for both Burke and Payne. It is the given world, those conditions we are born into without choice, that to Burke's eye make the theory of individualism inadequate. Because human generations are not independent of one another, human individuals are not independent of one another either. The facts of human birth and death and the social institutions built around them link individuals, families, and communities inexorably. And to pretend otherwise, let alone to sever their links, would be disastrous for political life. For Paine, meanwhile, the theory of individualism relies on an explanatory device, the state of nature, that takes the first human generation as its model, a generation for whom there was no given past. To apply a theory based on that premise is to deny the authority and significance of human generations and thus of tradition. And Paine is not shy about making that clear. The independence of individuals from their neighbors is a function of the independence of generations from their predecessors. This independence in the first generation is the essence of the theory of Enlightenment liberalism, which applies its timeless principles to all subsequent generations as well. Thus, a crucial common thread in the large and varied debates between Burke and Paine is apparently a dispute about the status of the past in political life, and both Burke and Paine are exceptionally explicit about its significance and take up the question of the meaning of the past in an uncommonly overt way. Paine's abhorrence of inherited government is the core of his political philosophy, for he sees inherited government as essentially opposed to nature, choice, reason, and justice. He wants to look past history and tradition to nature and therefore to look past given obligations to created choices, beyond received wisdom to pure reason, and beyond mere cumulative reforms to total revolution. Burke, meanwhile, says the model of inheritance is the model of nature, the appropriate means of understanding and meeting our obligations, the core of prescription, and the key to reform. Both men are students of political change, and in a certain respect, all of the themes taken up in this book are aspects of a dispute about change, its purpose, its character, its means, and its ends. But Burke's and Paine's view of the matter always clearly draw on this deep disagreement about the nature and meaning of the relations between generations. For Paine, the disjunction between the permanent principles of politics 
and the inherited realities of social and political life demands a revolutionary transformation, a break with the past to bring the real into alignment with the ideal made known by reason. For Burke, the evolved forms of political life, which are a valued inheritance, offer both the means and the ends of political change. When problems arise, society can employ its political institutions to address them, as those institutions have developed slowly over time to serve that purpose. But when a problem is too large for those institutions to contend with, and thereby threatens their survival, statesmen must reform the institutions in an effort to strengthen and preserve them, so that these institutions might be passed down to future generations, who will use them in the same way. This arrangement calls for gradual change in response to discrete needs and problems informed by a profound respect for the given order, because for Burke, the real is the only reliable means of grasping the ideal. Here we find the true bottom of the burke pain debate, and from here we can begin to appreciate how their differences have helped to shape our own. They disagreed about whether some basic aspects of the human condition, especially the facts that we are all born and that we all die, should decisively shape human societies. Paine's assertive, confident, rationalist, technocratic, and progressive outlook held that through the right kinds of political arrangements, man could overcome the limits that, that these facts might impose, and he could therefore reshape his world to his preferences, and even end the long-standing scourges of injustice, war, and suffering. Burke's grateful, protective, cautious, pious, gradualist, and reformist outlook held that man could only hope to improve his circumstances if he understood his own limits built on the achievements of those who came before him to repair their errors, and realized that some profound human miseries and vices are permanent functions of our nature, and that pretending otherwise would only make them worse. End quote. So that's the last section, and he really start, kind of brings it all home there, um, that the whole thing revolves around the concept of the past and the inher and inheritance, and that... Thomas Paine's perspective and the, and the perspective that has been adopted largely by uh, progressives of the modern era uh, and liberals of the modern era, and this is actually a point that I'm going to, I'm going to be developing more in, in this podcast, that Paine's view seeks to overcome the natural order of the world, the natural order of birth and death and the and the 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 need for continuity across generations is a a, na a natural system of life and death that we have these constraints that there are certain things about human nature that are permanent that we can't necessarily ever overcome war uh, and 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 the author um, Yuval Levin the author of this book makes the case that both here, both in that section I just read, as well as elsewhere in a section that I read to you previously, that pain seeks to liberate humanity from the constraints of the birth-death cycle, in a way. And the constraints of procre procreation. Um, and, you know, I, I'll go back, see, I don't know if I can find that section um, at this time, but, but the modern challenges that we that we face regarding uh, the relationship between men and women, uh, the the concept of procreation of of sex leading to pregnancy, um, pregnancy leading to birth, um, the whole life cycle is natural. And that liberalism seeks to overcome this natural life cycle and seeks to overcome the natural bonds of affection between people, seeks to overcome the natural state of man, to, see, to look back to some quote-unquote state of nature from some pre, you know, previous era or, or what have you that doesn't conform to reality at all. Doesn't conform to the way humans exist. So when you and and so this comes back sort of to the empiricist and the rationalist. When you look at the world and the way the world is, you can understand by observation how humans and how life uh, 
ba are, how our basic functions work. It doesn't require a theoretical model to be imposed upon the systems that we've developed. The systems that we've developed, we have developed them because they conform to the natural order of the world. For the most part, it's always tempered by various theories and but but the dogmatic adherence to some sort of theory or idea or even religious idea this dogmatic adherence to something that doesn't that isn't achieved through observation leads human societies vastly astray in our perpetual attempt to overcome nature that's that's my theory that's the theory that seems like Yuval Levin is pointing at here as well that pain is opposed to the natural order and Burke sees observes recognizes and values the natural order and seeks to preserve it that's the difference and that is something that is often contrary to what many people in the modern era see as the difference between the left and the right and it comes down largely to the perspective on uh, environmentalism and climate change and things like that so that the the notion becomes that the progressives or the left are are the more um, environmentally conscious and they're more uh, they're more in tune with the natural environment within which we live and there's more respect for the natural environment whereas the the conservatives are more concerned with industry and less concerned with nature and and so there's sort of a uh, it, it sort of gets flipped around and skewed in in, in different ways um, but I think that when you boil down to the philosophical underpinnings, conservatism says the natural world has a natural order. Humanity has a human nature. These things are real and we should adhere to them and not struggle so hard against them. And the other interesting thing is that the uh, what Thomas Paine, what he lays as, as the birth of the left and the birth of progressivism and the ideas of Thomas Paine, but he is a very, he is very much into individualism. Nowadays, the individualists oftentimes more wind up on the right because that tends to lead toward a libertarian perspective. Um, and the, and the, the, the shrinking of the individual into the society, the subsuming, I guess is the word I'm looking for, of the individual into the community, into the society, so that the needs of the community and society may overwhelm or, or overrule the needs of any given individual. That is nowadays often looked at as a leftist position. So that the right takes up the individual and the left takes up the community. But if you look at this book and how Paine and Burke, so Paine looks at the community as a conservative traditional uh, element of society. And Paine views the individual as, as, the, as the new revolutionary radical change to society to bring about the, the, the rise of the individual and the sovereignty of the individual. Um, and that's really interesting. You know, I don't want to discount the, the, um, the, the philosophy of individualism. I think that finding, um, finding a way forward is going to require us to both recognize uh, the, individ the importance of the individual, uh, but I think to some extent re the Republican Party is going to have to begin to see the community as sovereign rather than simply the individual, the atomized individuals uh, of, of, of libertarianism don't necessarily uphold community values. If we want to uphold community values, we need to, in a sense, make the community sovereign. And if we want to ensure that the United States of America, which is itself a community of sorts, doesn't fade into obscurity in the history books, we need to put the sovereignty of the nation above the sovereignty of the individuals within the nation that's a sense of nationalism that is coming into the Republican Party. So the, the whole individual community um, dichotomy and discussion is continually changing. It's not the same today as it was when this book was written, and it's changing as we speak. So this is all real interesting stuff and applicable to the modern era. And so I thank you for bearing with me up to this point. I know this has been um, a fairly long podcast. Uh, but I look forward to getting to the next book. We're going to look at 
uh, we're going to take so, sort of this same dichotomy that we've been exploring and we're going to track it back. We tracked it back to the Enlightenment with this book, The End of the Enlightenment, the French Revolution era. The, that's kind of the tail end of the Enlightenment. We tracked it back there, but next time we're going to track it all the way back to Plato and Aristotle, and that's going to be fun. So I hope you come back for our next episode. Uh, don't forget, you can check me out on Facebook. Um, under the Neofusionist book review. I'm on Twitter at Neofusionist. I'm on Patreon, uh, Neofusionist at gmail.com if you want to send me uh, an email or feedback. I'm on uh, Google Play. I'm on uh, uh, Apple Podcasts or, or whatever that service is called. So that, that'll wrap it up for today. Thanks for listening. Bye.